Okay, welcome back team. This is the second and final video for this week. And now we're gonna actually really start to implement and apply all the tenets of scientific analysis that we learned in the first video. And of course, we're gonna look at them through the lens of the assigned manuscript, which was the impact of diet in shaping the gut microbiota revealed by a comparative study in children from Europe and rural Africa. And so while we're going through this, I actually recommend you have your manuscript alongside whatever your um, video content player uh, of choice is and uh, grab a pen and maybe some notebook paper and take some notes or write along the paper, uh, whichever works best for you, as you learn some specifics um, that we want to point out here. As usual, this is not a comprehensive um, analysis uh, of the paper. We're going to do some more in class and even then we probably wouldn't hit it all. There's always something to unpack. So our primary learning outcome here for this video is to critically evaluate those section specific components, that paper DNA that we've learned about, the formula of how things are put together, using our assigned manuscript, and I actually have a couple of outside references for examples later on. And then learn how to synthesize all of these new findings and associated significances to convey the information via written summaries for two different audiences, a scientific and a lay audience, um, as well as a graphical abstract. And this second bullet is really a uh, free preview of part of the homework assignment. So it behooves you to stick around and listen in and learn how to uh, uh, look at some examples and then do your own uh, as it uh, pertains to this particular paper. And before we move forward, I always want to um, recommend that we are uh, looking for both positive attributes um, in the paper as well as potential issues. Um, we're not just going to uh, implement the Festivus uh, model of holiday airing of the grievances from Seinfeld, and I'm sure you don't know that reference, but that's okay. Um, we want to uh, not just um, bite at the article, but we also want to look for the good things too. This should help you not only read science, but also develop your own science. The best way to develop a new experiment to ask a new question is to read the literature itself first. Um, one very, very wise scientist once told me that a day in the library, um, nowadays online, uh, looking at articles, a day reading papers will save you a year or more at the lab bench so that you know what's already been done and so you know where to go next uh, from where the literature is leaving off. So we're going to take a walk through this and point out some um, fantastic uh, attributes as well as some potential pitfalls as well. So let's begin to evaluate. Um, we're going to start our critical exploration of this manuscript and I'm going to divide this up into three components. Uh, we're going to look at words and sentences used in the introductory and discussion materials. Then we're going to proceed towards the materials and methods. And finally, we're going to wrap it up with looking uh, critically at the results. And again, we're not going to go through every single component, but this should give you a good idea of how to go forward. So here we are. Um, first uh, bit of this here, and again, have your um, paper and maybe a good cup of coffee next to you or what other, other uh, beverage of choice you might uh, be enjoying right now. And let's look at the introduction and discussion. And so what I'm going to do is, um, on the left, give you a miniature uh, um, uh, version of the paper. Not that you should be able to see that. That's very small. But just to show you and highlight uh, where I'm going to be looking at. So here we are on the first page. And I'm going to blow up um, that second paragraph down there. Okay. And it starts, we do not yet completely understand. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because when you're first starting to think about the significance and uh, of the work and you want to make sure that the authors are conveying it to you correctly in the ways we described in the first video, this is where I kind of uh, really start to do, do some digging. And um, I've animated a box over two key words here, microbial ecology. And this is really, really at the heart of what this paper is about. We're going to compare two groups 
um, of people, and these are in two different parts of the world uh, on two different diets with other environmental factors that are different too, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and with the goal of characterizing those gut bacteria and looking for similarities and differences between those two populations. And so to characterize these things and show those differences really, really is a descriptive enterprise. Um, you may notice that you don't see any mechanisms of action in this particular article, and that's okay. Um, this is a very, very important first step to characterize these differences so that in the future directions, uh, people can look in and see how a particular microbe may or may not be interacting with a dietary component or producing a particular metabolite like those short-chain fatty acids you saw later on. So this at the heart is a story about microbial ecology, and I like that they point that out to you right away. So that's a good thing. Let's move over to the second column, and I'm going to look at this paragraph right here. Uh, my arrow is blowing up this part right here. Western developed countries successfully dot dot dot. This is the paragraph I'm going to look at. And we're still in the introductory materials. And this is still where the authors are setting up the story. And they really, really want to focus here on some of the human importance, some of that biological significance. Scientists always have to be good salesmen and saleswomen for their work. We have to advocate for what we're doing to get grant funding and also to go through the peer review process and publish papers. And so highlighting the potential um, biological implication for humanity is always a very important study uh, to point out. And um, I'm going to focus in right here on this second sentence. At the same time, a rise in new diseases such as allergic, autoimmune disorders, and inflammatory bowel disease both in adults and children have been observed, etc. And this is a fantastic context for you to understand uh, why we would want to even care about these gut microbiota species amongst different groups around the world. What I don't want you to do is um, make an overimportance on this particular uh, line here. You might be tempted to think that you're about to learn something that will definitively associate with some of these disorders, like allergies, for example, or autoimmune disorders, or IBD. The authors don't and do a very nice job of not uh, equalizing their findings with these at all. Uh, in fact, most of their results in their sentences lead to new hypotheses in their own words. We'll point that out later. But I don't want you, the reader, to think when you read this sentence that that's where we're headed. Um, so we're walking a fine line here uh, when we're, we're selling our science and its potential significance and what we're really actually showing in this paper. Because I really want to remind you of an important um, indicator uh, sentence that they've given you in their, in their paper when they presented the study design, and we're going to come back to this later in that section but that when they chose all the subjects in both of these areas, and in particularly the rural parts of Africa where diseases like malaria uh, can be found, is that all these subjects present it as healthy. So therefore, we are not actually making any determination about irritable bowel disease or autoimmune disorders necessarily here in this paper, because all these subjects did present, as they said, as healthy specimens um, in this early part of their life. Whether or not these are indicators for these disorders later on as they uh, age uh, remain to be determined, and there's nothing here that we can uh, uh, gain for, for that definitively. So we're not going to overstate our, our importance. Um, we are not going to, uh, as we analyze this paper, um, gain anything more than uh, what they're actually telling us. Moving to another part of the introduction, and uh, we're going to this uh, very last uh, paragraph of the introduction on that second column, and I'll blow it up here for you. It says, in our study, we address three general questions, and they really, really do a fantastic job of laying them out for you um, in terms of 
uh, what, what the study is going to show you. There is not an overstatement to be found. They are not suggesting they're going to give you a mechanism. They don't give you a mechanism. And you can really, really um, highlight uh, words that indicate as much. So, for example, in the second of their um, general questions, it says, is there a possible correlation between bacterial diversity and diet? You may have looked at these figures and said, oh, fantastic. Uh, they've pointed out to me differences between these groups, and therefore these are important for health and disease. But we need to pause and slow down and remember that all these subjects were healthy and that we're not learning any mechanism. So a word of caution that all scientists must operate with, and that is remembering the difference between correlation and causation. There's nothing here that's showing causation. This is uh, correlative at best. And to the credit of the authors, they're not suggesting anything more than that either. So we're okay with this. This is, this is the first step of sort of thinking about how the story was set up and um, what the questions were. And if everything seems to be uh, kosher in here, I think we are uh, on, a, on a great path forward. Now let's go towards discussion material. And what I'm going to do is flip to that page where we really kind of get into it. And it's on the same page where you see in the right-hand column the materials and methods. And what I'm going to do is, and as indicated by my arrow here, focus in on that second paragraph um, of this first column for discussion purposes. And it starts with, altogether, our results indicate a correlation between polysaccharide degrading microbiota, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, digest. Sorry, that was a, a bad pun, I think. Um, but I hope you understood what I meant. We're talking about microbes eating. And you may remember back in the biomath week, I called you all food bags because you're nothing but walking microbes. And those microbes are eating, and so you are what you eat, right? So uh, they're, you know was the digest the paragraph joke anyway let's move forward okay good um, I'm gonna start boxing to you statements containing words that indicate how you should think about these results they're a correlation again this is not causation they potentially influence we are not overstating our results here. If you had seen something like definitively influences or mechanistically influences instead of potentially influences, that should alert a red flag for you. But we don't see those types of um, conflations here. They're not, they're not suggesting causation at all. They're not p potentially suggesting you should either. They continue by saying, now that we understand this, we can make some new hypotheses based on our results. And I really, I really like that they did that. We can hypothesize that the microbes have co-evolved with the diet. And that's a very tempting hypothesis to make. And they could set up in the future some experiments to test this. And I bet you that group is planning to do that if they haven't already. If you skip down in the paragraph, it says substantial microbiota adaptation has probably accompanied the authors here do a fantastic job of representing their data in this discussion section and what it might mean by saying it might mean or probably and that future directions are definitely needed to dig deeper before we make any drastic um, conclusions about how this may or may not be influencing um, humans. I want to stay here on this theme, and we're going to move one paragraph down in the discussion to the paragraph that starts, our results suggest that diet has a dominant role over dot dot dot. Let's start right at the top. Our results suggest something. They don't say that they show conclusively or definitively. They don't say prove. They say that they, they suggest something here. Um, and that's important because we know there's other possible variables and they do a great job of mentioning them. Ethnicity, sanitation, hygiene, etc. You can't rule based on how this work was done some of these out. And so they say suggest. 
And I remember this being such an important lesson for me as a graduate student that my results suggested something. And I hinted at this at the, in the previous video of how my advisor had to make sure I understood the difference between showing something in a test tube and then suggesting uh, that I had the cure for a disease. No, they just suggested a particular observation was true in a test tube, and we had to leave it there. A mouse study is showing you what happens in a mouse. It's very, very arguable um, how applicable mice studies are to humans. Uh, we use them as models all the time, but there are significant differences, and that may explain a lot of the reason why beautiful studies in mice don't end up as clinical trials or successful therapies, or that there are human-specific differences that explain why these things may or may not work. If you keep going, they again say, we hypothesize then, based on the results. They could indicate. And so nothing seems out of order. Nothing seems overstated or exaggerated. I would say that there's a small exception to this as you finish out the discussion and look at the very, very last paper uh, paragraph before you uh, get to the methods. And that starts with the lessons learned from the BF children's microbiota. I want to point out the part that I think is a bit problematic or might lead people astray. And at the very last sentence, um, scientists typically try to really stretch and really, really think about um, what could potentially be the future of this work or its relevance. Not necessarily that it is. And so it says that the worldwide diversity in the microbiome from ancient communities where gastrointestinal infections can make the difference between life and death represents a gold mine. Hmm, wow, okay. For studies aimed at elucidating the role of gut microbiota on the subtle balance between health and disease, and for the development of novel probiotics. Nowhere in here do you have any suggestion that of, of, of many of this. Um, it could potentially be a gold mine. We may learn a lot, and we may elucidate, uh, as it says here, what makes health and disease based on gut microbiota. Um, and then potentially, if we have disease states, how something like a probiotic which means uh, a live bacteria that you could add to a maybe a gut in this case could could shift the species towards the ones that you're missing that we think are healthy but that's a very very far leap away from where we are right now in the world um, the idea that there is such a thing as a quote healthy microbiota a quote healthy grouping of bacteria that anybody should have or universally have um, is a pipe dream right now to be a gold mine. Um, and so this is where you might uh, begin to think that there's a uh, somewhat of an over salesmanship here at the end. And I really think the work could have just done it without this last uh, bit right here um, after that uh, comma where we just read, I don't think it's necessary whatsoever. 